Some new fellows here, sir. The activities on Pinamunda also began to attract the attention of the Allies, especially British intelligence. The British knew the Germans had been working on secret weapons even before the war, but never knew the type of weapons they were. But by 1943, enough intelligence had been gathered for Prime Minister Winston Churchill to take the threat seriously. He established a committee codenamed Crossbow to review all the evidence of German long-range weapons. Top secret reports compiled by British intelligence were taken by special courier to the cabinet war rooms deep underground in London, where the Crossbow Committee met. The committee was headed by Duncan Sands, a politician, and Churchill's son-in-law. The other leading figure was Lord Churwell, the British government's scientific advisor who strongly argued that the Germans were not capable of building a rocket which would pose a threat to the country. In simple terms, Cherwell believed the solid fuel rocket would be too large to be a practical proposition and that any alternative, particularly the use of liquid fuel, was beyond the technology of the time. Sands did not agree. Cherwell insisted that talk of a rocket was a hoax to conceal some other weapon, possibly a flying bomb. Sands, always the shrewd politician, believed the Germans probably had both a rocket and flying bomb, and immediately ordered an increase in aerial reconnaissance missions. A great deal of the evidence for the German long-range weapons had so far been obtained by photographic reconnaissance. Looking for secret weapons was a new field for the photographic interpreters, who had been trained to look for conventional military hardware and movement. You always checked in case there was something there that wasn't there before. And that's when you found, oh, there's a new road there, or there's a new, there's a new building there. What's that? So you get out the old cover and look that up. No building. So what are they putting up there? It just worked from checking over and over again. The breakthrough came when interpreters found a small pilotless aircraft sitting on the end of a firing ramp at Pinamunda. A possible flying bomb. Then, on June the 23rd, 1943, another sortie produced a photograph where a rocket could clearly be seen. The British were stunned. It was now obvious the Germans were planning a rocket attack on Britain. Duncan Sands immediately requested a massive bombing raid on Pinamunda. On the night of August the 17th, 1943, the Royal Air Force amassed 500 heavy bombers to attack Pinamunda. Their mission was not simply to destroy the base, but to kill the scientists and key people whose work threatened England. The raid was launched in complete secrecy. The true nature of the target was not revealed even to the RAF bomber crews. The inhabitants of Pinamunda were used to hearing enemy bombers fly over on their way to bomb Berlin. We did not take any notice of the sirens wailing. We did not even get out of bed for that because we were used to reconnaissance planes in the air, but we always thought they would not see us. High explosive and incendiary bombs began falling. Pinamunda was caught unprepared and soon became a sea of flames. And that particular night, I, I remember that very well, we went in into the ditches and lie down and the bombs came. There were a number of hits by bombs in buildings and fires began to burn. It was a very, very ghastly situation. Due to the phosphorus and the air pressure from the bombs, everything, including the debris, the sand, pine needles, were flying around. And then we saw all the bodies lying there, torn to pieces. A total of 735 people were killed. 
including many scientists, among them the man responsible for the A4 motor, Dr. Thiel. Thiel's family, his entire family, was completely wiped out. And there were, of course, a number of other key people, but Thiel was probably the most important man. And in that sense, probably the air raid uh, obtained its objective to kill the German workers so that the work could not continue in Peenemünde. The raid had severely damaged Peenemünde and set the A4 project back by several critical months. It also prompted the Germans to shift some of their experimental activities to an SS artillery range near the village of Blitzna in Poland, beyond the range of Allied bombers. Despite the setback to the A4 rocket, Hitler's other terror weapon, the deadly flying bomb, was at last ready to be unleashed against the Allies. The devastating RAF raid on the German base at Pinamunda was a serious setback to German rocket development. It had not affected Hitler's new flying bomb. By 1944, these terror weapons were now being secretly transported to their launch sites. A series of aerial reconnaissance missions by the Allies along the French and Belgian coast had identified a number of possible launch sites for long-range weapons against Britain. Gradually, one was able to build up that there was something going on. So then we managed to plot the whole of that coastline. There must have been over a hundred sites and alarm bells rang because it was much bigger than anybody expected. And all the sites were pointing to London. On June the 13th, 1944, exactly one week after the Allied invasion of Europe had begun, the first German flying bomb was launched across the English Channel. It landed in the east end of London, where it killed six people. Nazi propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels, announced to the world that Wergel Tungswaffe I, Vengeance Weapon I, had been used in retaliation for the Allied invasion of Normandy. The weapon was now known as the V-1. Over 3,000 V-1s would be launched against London in the next few weeks. The British knew little about the V-1. The blind, impersonal nature of the flying bombs made people on the ground feel helpless. There was no human enemy to shoot down. We did know they were coming because they made a very distinctive sound and it was a sort of room, 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 room and then suddenly it would stop and you just dive for cover wherever you were. There was this terrible silence. It just seemed like the whole world stopped. The V1s were launched day and night. The one-ton warhead of high explosives causing enormous damage in built-up areas. Cyril de Marne was a chief fire officer at the time. I was on many a job within minutes before the smoke had gone down. It was horrific, really. And you'd have uh, people, uh, members of the family, or possibly neighbours and people they knew, seeing dismembered bodies laying all over the street. And there were scenes of, uh, 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 of terrible distress. I saw so much of it that um, I hardened myself. I, you know, I, I couldn't afford to uh, be emotional about it, otherwise I wouldn't have been doing my job. Nobody escaped the effects of the indiscriminate bombing, although London schoolboys like Tony Moss felt it was an adventure. I suppose I didn't fully sense the danger, being only about 13 years of age. We got used to them. We even used to go out into the garden and watch these noisy things go over. They sounded like a motorcycle going across the sky. And uh, eventually, of course, they became known as flying bombs and then buzz bombs, and then people nicknamed them the doodlebug. 